タギヒオタトイティニマテ、ハイレ、ハイレ、ハイレ。タトイコアマフエネイ、キャウレタトイカトア、イガアホアタガオテワ。アヨキテラギ、アヨキテフェノア。アヨキガマナ、キガレオ、キガイウィカトア。エティメニカティネティ、ティナクエ。エティメニカデイヴィッツン、ティナクエ。Inga kai kōrero, koroma tua tore whānau, pola te sarero, Jesse Wong. He mihi nui tēnei ki a koutou, tēna rāwa a ta koutou. He mihi nui ki ngā mana whenua o te rohe nei, ati ati awa, taranaki whānui, ngāti toa rangatira. Ki te hunga, kua tai mai ki te tautoko i tēnei kaupapa whakahirahira, E whakanui ana i ngā mareikura, o tira i ngā wāhine katoa, e mihi ana. Nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Good morning and a very warm welcome to all of those joining us for the 2023 International Women's Day Parliamentary Breakfast. We begin this morning with an acknowledgement of the extreme weather event across parts of Aotearoa in the past few weeks. And we send our aroha and support to all the communities who have been affected. The challenges being faced across the nation underline the importance of today's theme, embrace equity. For those who've joined us online, from as far away as Chicago, the UK, Luxembourg, closer to home in Rotorua and Auckland, and as near as the Grand Hall. My name is Tupia Solomon Tanawai, and I am your MC for this morning's event, which is proudly brought to you by the Zonta Club of Wellington. Here in Parliament, we are joined by ministers, members of Parliament, members of the Diplomatic Corps, New Dame Companions of the New Zealand Order of Merit, public servants, high school students, Zonta members, friends and supporters. We are very fortunate to have an exciting lineup of speakers, including our host, the Honourable Jan Tanetti, as well as Her Worship, the Mayor of Wellington, Tori Fano. Also speaking today, we have Ms Paula Tesserero, NZM Chief Executive of Faikaha Ministry of Disabled People and Jesse Young, the founder of Ume Luxury Brand. Now that we have been joined by our participants online, we can officially start our program. I welcome Zonta member Belinda Himiona to open our proceedings with a karakia. Belinda is a member of Zonta and is proudly of Ngati Apa descent. Kia ora it's great to settle us into our day today with a karakia, karakia te matanga, ka inoi tātou. E whaka whakapehai ana mō tēnei rā, e whaka maumāhara ki ngā taonga tuku iho, ngā maonga, ngā awa, ngā moana, ngā rākau, ngā manu, hei tiri tiri mō tātou katoa, o tātou wairua hei hanga tangata kotahi, ki a mahi tahi ai mō te ao hau, Tino Pairawa, Amani. In a translation, we give thanks for this day. We remember the treasures that have passed on, the mountains, the rivers, the seas, the trees, the birds. They are there for us to share. Our aim should be to build friendships so that we may work together for a better world. Thank you. Well, thank you. Is there a token of our Appreciation. Thank you, Belinda, for opening us with a karakia. I now call upon Rebecca Bullen, President of the Zonta Club of Wellington and the youngest president in the club's history to give her opening address. Rebecca's parents were born in England and Samoa. She has been a Zonta member for five years and is proud to be the president of her hometown club. Thank you, Tupe. 
Kia ora tato. Kalo for lava. And so just like that, we're back in person. And so with genuine excitement and the warmest of wishes, let me join in extending a heartfelt welcome to all of us gathered together on this, the International Women's Day for 2023. On behalf of the Zonta Club of Wellington, it is a privilege to be joined by you all. Those of you here on New Zealand's parliamentary grounds and those of you joining us from wherever your corner of the world may be. Thank you all for taking this time in your day, celebrating, uplifting, inspiring one another together. Zonta is delighted to bring a breakfast celebration once again to Te Whanganuia Tara, kickstarting another IWD here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and indeed across the world. Our local club is made up of more than 50 members, 50 women that look to empower, equip, and energize others. Each of us with our own skills and passion, and what unifies us here today is the Zonchen call to build a better world for women and girls. A mission that stands on the shoulders of so many. A mission that we are reminded again today can only truly be achieved when we all embrace equity. It is a pleasure to be joined by many familiar faces today. We recognize, however, that it is the important message, the wonderful company, and the inspirational speakers that bring many more of you to our door. And for those of you that are hearing about our Zonta Club for the first time, we are a somewhat small but mighty part of a leading global organization one of more than 1,100 clubs across 62 countries. What all Zonchen share, representing countless cultures in all ages, what we share is a vision, a vision of a world in which women's rights are recognized as equal rights, and every woman is able to achieve her full potential. In such a world, women have access to all resources and are represented in decision-making positions on an equal basis with men. In such a world, no woman lives in fear of violence. And with this vision comes a call to action, and that is why our club not only supports the projects changing communities on an international scale, why it's equally proud to engage with the platform and projects of District 16 Zonta New Zealand, with national connections and partnerships such as grandparents raising grandchildren. It's why we also look local from hand-sewn pamper packs to fundraising fiestas, from our annual take on the Zonta Says No to Violence Against Women campaign, to awarding the prestigious Zonta Science Award, and then our current partnership with the Wellington Women's House Trust. Our members pop up in different spaces throughout the year, guaranteeing a service, advocating for others, offering the best kind of community. And while I am extremely proud of what we achieve, and who and how we get there, I'm also one of many who eagerly await our speakers today. So please do look us up, keep in touch. There are flyers, website links. We really would love to hear from you in the year ahead. But with that, it is my pleasure to welcome back our MC to formally introduce our host. Thank you, Rebecca, for those words of welcome. Papatai tēle lava. Our first speaker for this morning is also our host for the event, the Honourable Jan Tanetti, Minister for Education, Minister for Women, and Minister for Child Poverty. Prior to entering politics, Jan's career was firmly established in education, serving as both primary teacher and principal, and advocating at a national level for equal educational opportunities. It's my pleasure to invite the Honourable Jan Tanetti to share her remarks. Kia ora koutou, namahi nui kia koutou in Malawa Lele, and warm greetings to you all. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here and to speak with you today on International Women's Day. I'm just so delighted that we can be here in person. I had an interview this morning on Breakfast TV in the Grand Hall as people were starting to come in, which looked quite good too. Uh, it, 
and we talked about what International Women's Day meant. And International Women's Day is a time to reflect on our progress, our call for continued change, and celebrate the achievements and contributions of women across Aotearoa New Zealand. I was asked about how we get that balance right today. It's not just about uh, where we've got to and where we are, we are, what we've got to do next, but it's also about that celebration, and I think that's a really, really important point because we have come so far. Today we reflect on those who have paved the way for women in marginalised communities across Aotearoa. And I want to, at this point, take a moment to acknowledge the life and legacy of Georgina Bayer. We remember her as a trailblazer, living a proud public life as a trans woman, championing human rights and gender identity. And I want to say thank you, Georgina. I'd like to start too by acknowledging the people and communities impacted by the recent flooding and by Cyclone Gabrielle. We know that many wahine and their whānau have been impacted by recent events across the upper half of Aotearoa. We continue to send our araha and support to those affected, many of whom are not only balancing the needs of themselves and their whānau, but also supporting the communities around them. I know that some of you have made the trip here and I also acknowledge my colleague Anna Lork and the work that you have done in your community. We acknowledge your mahi, your strength and your resilience. Thank you also to the people on the front line right now, including emergency service personnel, community workers and volunteers. You're not only personally affected by these events, but you are supporting your community and keeping everyone sa safe. Last week I spent some time in the Coromandel visiting schools and speaking with communities affected. We know that the rebuild won't be easy, but I do know and I am confident that together we can do it. I'd secondly like to acknowledge the Zonta, Club, Zonta International Club of Wellington for organising this event today. It's important that we continue to come together on International Women's Day, however that looks like, and I did say that this is the first time that I've actually had an in-person event as Minister for Women, but it is important that we come together to mark where we are and where more needs to be done. I'd also like to acknowledge a wide range of amazing people we have here this morning with us, including secondary students and teachers, representatives from NGOs, diplomats and visiting delegations, recently conferred dames, members of the armed forces and police, and my parliamentary colleagues. I'm reminded looking out at this audience of the strength that we have as women and the role that we also have to play in playing to make lives better for our women and girls across the Motu. International Women's Day is a good time to take stock to celebrate our amazing wahine in Aotearoa. So on that note, I would like to acknowledge the 88 amazing women who received recognition in the 2023 New Year's Honours. It is always a pleasure to see these individuals recognised and to read about their amazing contribution. And I encourage you, all of you, in the context of your work and in your communities, to think about who you could put forward for future rounds of honours. Amazingly enough, sometimes we're not very good as women at putting our hands up to say how well we've done, but I know that each and every one of you in this room know amazing women who you work with, interact with on a daily basis, who we could put forward for honours. So please think about those people and how we can acknowledge them. Together let's keep celebrating and elevating the many amazing women across Aotearoa. It's also important today to acknowledge where we need to do better to ensure women and girls are afforded every opportunity to thrive and reach their full potential. The government is committed to achieving gender equality and has a wide range of work underway to achieve this. My priorities as Minister for Women reflect where further work is needed, including around economic empowerment, safety and leadership. And I will touch on some of these streams of work today. But I'd also like to acknowledge my colleague Marlena Davidson and the wonderful work that she is doing in the, as Minister of the Elimination of Prevention of Sexual and Domestic Violence. So thank you Marlena for the work that you are doing, because that is critically important work. 
The theme for International Women's Day 2023 is Embrace Equity, which aims to get the world, the world talking about why equal opportunities are no longer enough. There is a difference between equality and equity. Equality means each individual or group of people is given the same resources or opportunities, whereas equity recognises that each person has different circumstances and allocates the resources and opportunities needed to reach an equal outcome. If we want people to be equal, we need to remember that not everyone starts in the same place or indeed faces the same barriers. We know that many people and communities face more barriers to well-being or to meeting their potential. This includes women, Māori and Pacific people, disabled people and people from rainbow communities. The goal of equity is to address systemic and structural barriers that get in the way of people's ability to thrive. And we should take time today to consider what stands in the way of equity for our communities and how we can address those barriers. I've reflected on this year's theme. What have I done and what am I doing to address imbalanced social systems and help women achieve e equity? I am privileged to be able to use my role as Minister for Women to champion and speak on women's issues and to support work that will improve the lives of women and girls in all of their diversity. 2023 is a special year for women in Aotearoa, New Zealand, as this year we are commemorating 130 years since the Electoral Act was passed, enshrining in law the right of women to vote. And when I um, was thinking about this, I thought, yes, it is five years since we had that 125-year celebration, and that's gone really fast. Today we are also reflecting on those trailblazing women and their achievements in fighting for our rights and the betterment of our society. It is also cause for celebration in October last year when we reached a milestone in Parliament, achieving equal representation of women MPs. Many of you would also note that this was absolutely long overdue. 129 years since that act passed. As you know, or may know, last year I launched Mahiri Fai Mahi Wahini Women's Employment Action Plan, which sets out a range of actions designed to address employment barriers and improve outcomes for women. The actions outlined in the plan form crucial parts of the government's overall employment strategy that will also support better outcomes for women, including those who are more vulnerable in the labour market. It always bears repeating that improving women's employment quality, access and experiences does generate lifetime and intergenerational benefits. Manatu Wahini, Ministry for Women, will continue to play a vital role in monitoring the implementation of the plan, as well as leading actions in a number of areas. One of those areas is pay, pay transparency, and implementing this is one of the key actions that we have identified that will help, or could help, I should say, women's uh, pathways within their employment. This is work that uh, my colleague and myself, Minister Radhakrishnan, Priyanka Radhakrishnan, are leading what this could look like at this point in time. The National Advisory Council on the Employment of Women has been appointed as the advisory group for pay transparency and will be engaging with their partners to ensure a wide range of views are heard as advice is developed. I'm also pleased to note that the Ministry and MB are preparing an upcoming Future of Work tripartite forum which will focus on women's employment. The forum is a partnership between Government, Business New Zealand and the New Zealand Council of Trade Unions. It aims to support New Zealand businesses and workers to meet the challenges presented in a rapidly changing world of work. The forum meets a few times a year, with each meeting focusing on a particular theme. And I look forward to chairing this upcoming meeting, which will bring opportunities to work together to develop solutions. Topics for the forum are still being confirmed, but it is likely on pay that it will cover pay transparency and access to childcare, which we have ident has been identified in the Women's Employment Action Plan as a barrier to women progressing within the workforce. We know that these are both important elements in supporting women's employment opportunities. As I'm sure you'll agree, education is also a powerful tool to support transformational change, and I'm committed to ensuring education is equitable for all. 
Last year, the government launched a number of new resources to support wellbeing and the teaching of relationships and sexuality education in schools in Kura. And these resources include information about consent, digital safety and healthy relationships. And another important initiative is underway in schools, our period products programme. This programme aims to reduce period poverty that affects so many menstruating students and their families in whānau. I'm pleased to share that over 2,147 schools, kura, activity centres and alternative education providers have opted into this initiative, representing 96% of estimated menstruating students. And it is making a big difference. Wherever I go, I am told about the difference that it's making. Now, I've only touched on some of our key areas of work, but as you know, there is more to do. And I did point out this morning that it has made a difference having 50% of our parliament as women because it means that we can easily talk about and talk about legislation that makes a big impact of women. And I want to thank all the women from all parties here who have been part of that journey over the last wee while. It will be a busy year ahead and also a really exciting one as we continue to make progress across a number of areas for women and girls. I want to thank you for your support and your expertise in all of these important areas. I look forward to hearing from the rest of this morning's speakers, but I do want to say a big happy International Women's Day to you all. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Honourable Minister, on behalf of the Santa Club of Wellington, thank you once again for hosting the celebration of International Women's Day at Parliament. After two year hiatus due to the pandemic, we are incredibly glad and grateful to you as Minister for Women. As is the tradition for Santa Rose Day, we present you with these yellow roses as a token of our appreciation, not only for your time today, but also for all the work you do to build a better world for women and girls. Tenato, Minister. Thank you. Our next speaker is Wellington's first Wahine Māori Mayor. Originally from Pātea in South Taranaki, Tori is of Pakakoe and Ngā Ruahine descent. She is an advocate for social change, affordable housing and decarbonised transport. Please welcome Mayor Tori Fano to the stage. <laughs> Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ko pakakoi toku iwi, hu uri tēnei nō taranaki, ko tōri whānau toku ingoa. Um, look, I've got to be honest, it is incredibly humbling uh, as a new mayor to be uh, standing here speaking in front of so many amazing women and gentlemen um, and to follow um, a, a minister for women. Like that, that, That's pretty cool, so thank you for having me. Today, I'm going to be talking about my own leadership journey, uh, the, the hard struggles to get to this point, because I think um, for those of us wanting to lead, inspire and represent, we know it's a tough road ahead of us, and I think it's incredibly important that we share um, our stories with each other, empathise with each other, and I know that we've got some young uh, future leaders uh, in this room, and I think, look, we have to be here to support each other. First, I'd like to start talking about a couple of my role models. So, uh, my grandparents, um, who not only taught me the true value of a, a strong work ethic, but of course gave me the strength to run for mayor. 
Annette Kahu Kuranui. She was the peak example of a hard-working woman. She raised three kids while working multiple jobs to support her whanau. Uh, so a cleaner, a postal worker, uh, the local dairy. Uh, she'd catch the train in, uh, from well no to Wellington from Cannons Creek, where she'd head to one of her jobs as a cleaner for Victoria University, which the same university that I would study media, film, politics almost 20 years later. My koro, Rongotu Patia Kahu Kirinui, was a theatre and film actor in Wellington, and he started things like um, Yvonne McKay's The Silent One, performed on stage shows such as Circa, Theatre, and the Festival of Arts. So I definitely, <laughs> that's um, where I got my, you know, started to get my passion for Wellington as well, because we know we're a strong arts community here. He was also an activist. Uh, we had protests on the steps of Parliament on behalf of our iwi. And I remember, it was only the Green Party uh, who had the integrity to come and meet him. And so that's where my connection with the Green Party started uh, as a young teenager. It was also him who decided that I ought to be a politician, even though he didn't tell me that at the time. Uh, at boarding school, he'd send me newspaper clippings of um, his protests, political uh, events, and at home, he'd make me watch the six o'clock news with him so I understood what was going on. That left a very lasting impression on me. When thinking about our leadership, I think it's really important to draw from your own whānau and your experiences, whether it's positive, negative, or even traumatic. These experiences shape who we are. I've had my own experiences with drug and alcohol issues, which gave me the passion for alcohol harm reduction, and it's an area that I want to work, uh, work in in future. I've witnessed domestic violence, which is why I'm a supporter of Women's Refuge, Wellington Rape Crisis, and of course the Honourable Marama Davidson's fantastic work in this area. It is that experience that led me to politics. I joined par Parliament in 2015, uh, and I looked up to uh, the Honourable Jacinda Ardern, uh, Matiria Ture, and of course the Honourable Marama Davidson. So I've been blessed to be surrounded by staunch women and wahine Māori to learn from. What a buzz. Yeah, can, can we just, oh, she's so fabulous. Um, it was through the 2017 election where I became the Chief of Staff of the Green Party and tasked with keeping our party together after a mind-blowing uh, drop in the polls and election campaign. While at the same time seeing Matiria Ture and her whānau pulled through the ringer in a brutal election for something she did while she was young and struggling. The double standard was hideous. And we've all been through that sort of stuff, but she held her head up high and I'll never forget that. Recently, we've seen the Honourable Jacinda Ardern receive her fair share of extreme abuse and she's had to step down. And I actually applaud her for that, putting herself and her whānau first. So when government was formed that year, um, there was this moment that I'll, I'll never forget. I sat in a room with the most senior staff from the coalition. So we had uh, the Labour Party, New Zealand First, and the Green Party, so the Chiefs of Staff, Chief Presex, Chief Policy Advisors. And out of the 10 people that, uh, that were in that room, only two were women, and that was myself and my deputy. And there was only one Māori in the room. I was pretty terrified. Talk about imposter syndrome. Seeing all these men talk over each other while my deputy and I just stared at, stared at each other from across the room was something else. And it didn't really change over the years either. But we persevered and we acknowledged we're operating in a world that isn't set up well for women and Māori and that we need to be strong. So I put on my armour, my red lipstick, my black blazer and built those relationships with the male Chiefs of Staff of New Zealand First and the Prime Minister. But what was interesting that it wasn't actually that armour that disarmed them. I found that I didn't have to be that badass queen for them to respect me. I showed them my vulnerability. It was behind closed doors, but what I showed them was the real me. I told them about my anxieties, about being G for staff, about being tired, my favourite wines, Netflix shows, and things that got me through such a tough role, and thankfully it worked. They develop, developed a high level of trust and respect for me, and we all remain friends to this day. Which brings me to the mayoralty. This campaign wasn't easy. I faced racial abuse, sexual harassment, 
and just plain creepy behaviour. I've had men show up uninvited to private events, online trolls calling me a show pony and nothing else. Anyone who runs for public office, left or right, I've gained a huge respect for. These roles ain't easy, especially for women. What I've learned is that we need to change the narrative so that you're not the only woman sitting at the table. That means more women in leadership roles and politics. Wellington has a good representation of women around its council table, but I'd like to see more. More women leading organisations at a grassroots level right through to parliament. Specifically, more Māori and Pacifica. I'm looking for a way to do this, so watch this space. I'll be announcing something in a couple of months. Another huge lesson, we must ask for help. We mustn't be whakamā about asking for help. I tried to be this fierce queen and do all of it alone and prove that I was, I don't know, powerful. But actually, asking your fellow queens is powerful. Five months ago, I was elected as mayor, knowing very little about council or its processes, and it's been a steep learning curve. But I've asked for help, and people have stepped up and offered it. You'll be amazed at just how many people want to lift you up. And finally, always lead with empathy. In a council context, empathy is important because every decision we make relates to people, relates to our residents. We've just passed a rates increase, which for many will be tough. But we've had to balance that against the needs of the city. As mayor, there was much discussion behind closed doors, and it wasn't a decision taken lightly, and it meant juggling councillors competing political agendas against the needs of the city and what ratpayers could afford. I feel guilty about this, to be honest, because I know it's going to hit some people in the back pocket. But all I can think about is what we leave for our future generation, a climate-resilient city that's affordable. I stand here as Mayor of Wellington, and I'm proud to represent many of you. As the capital's first Wahine Māori Mayor, I think this is proof that times are changing. While it won't be easy, it's an exciting opportunity these times for all of us. So if I had to give my younger self advice on how to be a leader, it would be this. Remember your roots, remember your whānau, remember your experiences. I started life in a state house in Pirirua before moving to Pātea, uh, but my family provided me with love, support, and most of all, a belief that I could be whatever I wanted. Have role models and mentors. Find people who will help you on your journey. I have some in this very room today and I'm very thankful for their help. Leadership is also about supporting others, but also asking for help and having empathy. Hiding it behind a mask isn't actually that healthy in the long term. Don't be afraid to show your true self. And for, remember, no one is perfect. Everyone in leadership positions uh, ends up making decisions that they're not sure of, but lean into that uncertainty. It will only make you stronger. Thank you for inviting me here to speak on International Women's Day. Uh, and a huge thank you to Zonta, uh, of which I am now a member, and I encourage you to. Uh, but look, ladies and gents, we can do this. This is an exciting future for all of us. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou katoa. Nā mihi to our Wellington Mayor, Tori Fano. We have been honoured to hear from you today and your experiences as a wahine. Thank you for sharing and celebrating International Women's Day with us all. You are an inspiration. Please accept these roses as a token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. Oh. Give a card too. Well, coming up next, we have Jessie Wong, the founder of Ume. This luxury leather goods brand was established in Dunedin in 2015 and is now stocked in internationally renowned fashion destinations. The materials used by Ume are traceable down to farm level and they are proud certified Toy 2 Carbon Net Zero. In 2021, Jessie was the winner of the Women of Influence Award for Business Enterprise. I now invite Jessie Wong to take the stage.
Kia ora It's an honour to be here with you today to celebrate International Women's Day. When I was thinking about the setting for this speech, I couldn't help but smile. Parliament, the place where they make the rules. A place where the rules can be rewritten. So today I want to tell you three stories about rewriting the rules. That's it, no big deal, just three stories. The first story is about rebellion. When I was in fashion school, I named my final collection, Well-Behaved Women Seldom Make History. Coined in the 70s, I discovered the phrase while reading a book that explored why it was that women who break with convention are the ones who are remembered. To a lot of people, that's come to mean history remembers those who break the rules, who surprise society, not by doing what is expected of them, but by doing exactly what is not. But to me, the saying also shines a light on everyday women, the ones who historians, men, never paid attention to. I'm proud to come from a long line of rebellious women, generations who never cared for much for societal norms. My great-grandmother Vi was a woman very ahead of her time, and I know some of you um, mentioned before you have uh, the Vi bag. Um, she was in the 20s, she wore pants, she hung around with artists, and she smoked from a long cigarette holder. Towards the end of her life, she once said that her only regret was all of the parties she missed. But she was also incredibly intelligent, and I'm wearing her ducks medal today. Judy, my grandmother, raised five kids under six. She was a female truck driver, a real estate agent, and wrote a column in the Otago Daily Times. My mum, Jane, wasn't quite as hard out, but she did complete three degrees and walked the Rootburn track at nine months pregnant. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> These are the type of women that I wanted to design for in fashion school, and they're the type of women that I'm still designing for now. Small acts of rebellion, even in design, matter. They matter because they change the way we see ourselves and the way that we act. Historically, women's clothes didn't feature pockets because women never earned or held money. And the design and capital problems and implications that that resulted in have fossilized through time. Even in 2015, the bag designs that dominated the market were still based on that blueprint of Coco Chanel, the one that she set in motion 100 years prior. Although she was the inventor of ready-to-wear, which is a deeply modern way of dressing, and I'm very glad that we have that on racks today, Chanel looked to bag design that could carry her secret love letters and her lipstick. Now, I don't know about you, but the love letters that I've received recently have been written on ChatGPT and text me. Um, so what I needed in a bag at the time was my lunchbox, my laptop, my visual diary, charges, makeup bag, Sunny's case, the kitchen sink. So I did what any frustrated female would have done and I designed my own solution. At UMay, each bag is born from a base sense of utility designed to carry everything you actually need in a day. They're inspired by and named after the forward-thinking modern personalities of real people in my life. In Vi's case, this was a crossbody party bag designed to keep you dancing until 6 a.m. And I think there's utility in that, to be honest. <laughs> but equally, materiality matters just as much as design. And from the beginning, we've made bags with regenerative New Zealand DNAPA and have championed it relentlessly. It's buttery soft, strong like a cowhide, but supple like lambskin. Perfect for large laptop-toting bags that women of today want to wear. It's the reason why we were picked up recently by Bergdorf Goodman, who felt that the hand feel and brand story would resonate with the, their audience of busy New York women. So the message in this story is this. It's the rebellious purpose that makes a difference, whether you're making history or not. Don't be afraid of what people think. Just put those blinkers on and go for it. My second story is about the power of persistence, which my team who are sitting here today, thank you for waking up so early, know all about. 
It didn't take me very long to realize that making bags myself with my small but mighty in-house team would not be a very sustainable way to grow the business. Instead, we started looking for manufacturing partners who could work with Deer. Our Tanner Barry, who had a long-standing relationship with Prada and their manufacturing network, had mentioned his connections with the luxury house once or twice. And pretty soon, I was calling Barry on the regular to request an intro. After a year of persistence and maybe 30 phone calls, uh, Barry agreed to introduce us to one of their top factories, one who had 20 years of experience working with Napa. Barry's hesitation was that we were too small, too DIY, and too inexperienced to work with such a well-respected industry leader. The manufacturing company, which had been in luxury leather goods for over 50 years, took an immediate shine to us. Keith, whose family owned the business, said I reminded him of a woman named Tori, an American designer who had grown her company with him. When she first approached him, Keith and Tori worked together on a very small order of only 50 wallets. He said it wasn't about the scale of the order, it was about the relationship and the potential that he saw in Tori to grow. Keith told us to go away and work really hard on growing a business, and I remember a period of time where that was top of the agenda in every Monday morning meeting. And if we could show him a few years of consistency, they'd think about it. He was prepared to support us while we were small, as he'd done for Tori, and it took three years and five visits, but eventually they agreed to work with us. And I remember that moment because we were so surprised that we didn't have any designs with us. We had to go home to the hotel overnight and design everything um, and bring it back the next day. Because I'd made the first 500 bags myself, the craft was incredibly close to my heart and we needed to work with someone who understood both craft and scale. These guys were it. The Tory he was talking about was Tory Birch, who almost 20 years later had a billion dollar business. So no matter where you are in the world or how small you think you may be, at the end of the day, it's where we see ourselves that determines where we land. Have a vision, be persistent, and if you break a lofty goal into small steps and keep working toward it every day, you will achieve it in the end. My third story is about bravery. Have the courage to do things that make sense, and don't simply do things because it's the way they've been done in the past. We'd just received our first delivery from our shiny new manufacturers when the chatter of COVID began. We opened our first UMA lounge in Wellington in August 2019, and were due to open our second in Auckland in March 2020. Like the rest of the country, we found ourselves in lockdown. When the Prime Minister announced in this very building that we had 48 hours to make a plan, with overheads, wages, and stock to pay for, we found ourselves looking for ways to continue trading. I often ask my team, if this was easy, what would it look like? And that day, that was the biggest question in the room. We sat, had a cup of tea, and then got to work, photographing every bag that we could get our hands on, from samples, archive pieces, and buyback bags, we drove the SD card full of these photos up to Johnsonville and threw it over the fence in a snap block bag to our editor who was already in isolation. Over the first two weeks of lockdown, we worked relentlessly to build a customized website through which we could host a digital event. How could we replicate the experience of a UMA lounge when we couldn't actually be there? The answer was deceptively simple. We featured an archive selection of one-off products, a photo booth, and curated playlists. We nervously worked through the night to bring our digital vision to life and could have never predicted the response that would meet us the following morning. At 8.30 a.m., 11,000 people sat patiently in our online waiting room. We opened our virtual doors at nine and sold over 600 bags in 16 minutes. We've held these events every year since, with 30,000 customers joining us in January. It was during that first digital event that we realized the immense strength of the community that had formed around us. And I, yeah, it was just an, a really incredible moment for the whole team. If you go back in our Instagram stories, you can actually watch our in real time reaction to this happening. 
The playbook for fashion was wide open, and it took bravery to make change in the ways that we did things. Although our wholesale channels were at a standstill, and our retail stores were closed for most of the time, the brand grew rapidly across the two years that followed, and landed us a spot on the Deloitte Fast 50. We continued to open Yume lounges and curate these spaces for our community. It's probably not where a lot of people saw us ending up, but over the past seven years, we've built a strong group of forward-thinking women in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and now we have an ambition to take Yume to the world. So I want to leave you with this. If well-behaved women seldom make history, let's redefine bad behavior. Be rebellious, be persistent, and be brave enough to rewrite the rules so that they reflect the systems and solutions that matter to you. Have ambitious goals and surround yourselves with the types of people who would put forward your name in a room of opportunity, and be that person yourself. Namihi. Thank you very much, Jesse. I know that as someone who sees your bags every day in the office, I'm someone who was very excited as soon as I heard that you would be coming here um, to speak with us this morning. Um, and thank you for telling us about how much bravery and persistence it's taken for you to build a community of this generation's rebellious woman. So please accept these flowers as a token of our gratitude to you. Our final speaker for this morning is Ms. Paula Tesserero, MNZM, Chief Executive Faikaha Ministry of Disabled People. Previously the Disability Rights Commissioner and Chief Human Rights Commissioner, Paula is a Paralympian, winning a gold medal and two bronze medals at the 2008 Summer Paralympic Games in Beijing. Her focus is on providing strategic leadership to achieve better outcomes for disabled people in New Zealand. On that note, I invite Paula Tesserero to share her thoughts with us. Inga mana, inga reo, rorangatira maa, tēnā koutou kātou. Ko Paula Tisirero tōko ingoa, ko taku tūranga mahi he tumuaki mō Whaikaha, the Ministry of Disabled People. Talo falawa, ki orana, warm Pacific greetings to everyone this morning. My name is Paula, I'm the Chief Executive of Whaikaha, the Ministry of Disabled People. For those unable to see me, I, uh, I like to think I'm taller than five foot, but I'm actually just a little bit under. I'm wearing a white top with black spots, red pants, and I'm standing behind a podium. And my sign name is to mimic two bicycle pedals moving in a forward motion to reflect my uh, passion and past world as an athlete. I want to acknowledge the words and sentiments of previous speakers, the Honourable Jan Tanetti, uh, who worship the Mayor, um, and Jesse. Thank you for, for sharing your wisdom this morning, and I appreciate that going last, when you're probably all dying for your second cup of coffee, um, but this morning's a great opportunity to come together. So thank you to uh, Zonta for having me here uh, because I can say that over many, many years, I've been to many women's celebration events, and there weren't disabled women speaking, uh, or part of the groups that were hosting the events. And I think in recent years, this is starting to change. More needs to happen, but it is starting to change. My background is in law and human rights. So Zonta's international vision of a world in which women's rights are recognised as human rights and every woman is able to achieve her full potential resonates strongly with me. And it's really important to place emphasis on the word every. So for many years, 
various things that I've done. Different organizations would say, we'll get to disability, Paula. We'll, we'll get there. No one told me as a kid there was an order that we must follow, <laughs> that somebody would decide that disabled woman came last. And who got to make up that rule? It's really important that we recognise the rights and intersections of all groups. We need to embrace the skills, attributes and experiences of people from diverse and different backgrounds. And actually we need to really collectively, all together, smash the ever looming glass ceiling so that every woman can come with us. Not just the small cracks, so that some woman can get through. Today I want to talk about the ministry that I have the privilege of leading, Faikaha, the Ministry of Disabled People. It is the first ministry of disabled people in the world. I want to tell you a little bit about my own personal journey and story. And like other speakers, I want to acknowledge those affected by recent weather events. Faikaha has been working alongside disability organisations, local providers and agencies to do everything we can to support disabled people in their whānau who have been impacted and will always be disproportionately impacted through climate crisis. And as today is International Women's Day, I particularly like to mihi to the wahine who have been integral to that response. A little bit about me. So my previous roles and experiences have shaped me into the proud disabled leader that I am today. I've had huge opportunities as a Paralympian, being able to serve on sport and disability organisations, being the chef de mission for our team that went to Tokyo uh, while the rest of New Zealand was in lockdown, uh, being a senior public servant and having had the rich experience of being the Disability Rights Commissioner just prior to this role. But the confidence to do those things took years to foster because the reality is that growing up as a disabled kid in New Zealand, when I was growing up, meant you really fought for inclusion and acceptance every single step of the way. And I don't want young disabled girls growing up believing their only way to excel is to hide their impairment, if they can, which is what I did, or to lower their expectations of themselves which isn't, wasn't really hard growing up, actually, if everyone else's expectations of disabled people was also a bit low. My identity as a disabled woman permeates every single thing I do. It permeates my professional career. It permeates my role as a mum. It permeates how I am as a wife, a friend, a member of our community. When my appointment as the Chief Executive of Whaikaha was announced, there was much to be said about the first disabled Chief Executive of a public service agency. But no one said, oh my gosh, a woman has been appointed. Imagine if we had said that, there'd be an outcry. So I'm really looking forward to the day that there is an outcry when we determine it's important to highlight that a disabled person is doing an important job. And when I got the job, our old friend, imposter syndrome, paid a visit, and she doubled down. The fact that so much was made of being the first disabled chief executive gave our imposter friend wings. Because imagine if the first disabled chief executive of a government agency fails. The weight of that responsibility sits heavily on me, but it also lights my fire in terms of what we can achieve if we embrace the theme of true equity. Equity for all women. 
because at 24% of New Zealand's population, we simply cannot afford to not focus on equity for disabled people. I want to touch on the point of representation that other speakers have talked about, because representation matters. And I'm acutely aware that as people put themselves forward for public roles or big roles, that role modelling becomes really, really important. Disabled women will know that there is equity when disabled women see ourselves represented widely in this building, in local government, in all business, and in community organisations, where it's just the way that things happen. Representation really matters. And if business are not thinking about the 24% or the just over 1 million New Zealanders who are disabled, then that's a massive lost opportunity. So I want to move on to touch on Faikaha, our new ministry. We're still yet to be fully established, but our history goes back many years. Much of the disability community's fight for change aligns with the feminist movement. For both movements, change has come through the advocacy of leaders within our community, many of whom are no longer with us, who fought for decades for the removal of structural and systemic barriers. You know it's right and proper and fair that we celebrate many women who have been trailblazers for Aotearoa. Do you know who the disabled woman trailblazers were? It's my hope that in the organisation that I'm lucky to lead, that actually right across our walls will be the disabled people who created the advocacy and convinced government to establish our entity. And then it's my hope that actually every New Zealander can name all of the disabled trailblazers in New Zealand. Their advocacy led to the government launching Faikaha on the 1st of July last year, and I took up the role as CE in September. We were gifted the name Faikaha, a te reo Māori word reflecting strength and ability. And it was gifted from Maka Tibble a blind Ngāti Pro kaumātua and disability advocate who gave decades of his life to promoting a culture of diversity and inclusion. Our vision is for a non-disabling, connected society where the just over 1.1 million disabled people and tangata whaikaha Māori in New Zealand have an equal opportunity. It's vital to me and our community that Faikaha achieves its objectives to both transform disability support services and drive the wider change needed. We know that these improvements are needed and the government's given a clear mandate to transform in line with the enabling good lives approach, which is centered on a person's strengths. It seeks to ensure that disabled people have choice and control in our own lives, because actually choice and control for disabled people in many aspects of life simply does not exist. Disabled people experience many, many barriers, and the mandate we have at Faikaha is to steward change across government to remove those barriers. One of the reasons our ministry was set up was to move away from a medical model of disability which says, hmm, we've got to fix that impairment, to one which focuses on reducing barriers for disabled people. Because it isn't the wheelchair that creates disablement, it's the stairs. It's not the cane that creates disablement, 
It's the absence of braille or audiovisual descriptions. It's not the behavior of a child in the classroom that's at fault. It's about our ability to respond and provide the right sensory environment. When we understand that social model of disability, it focuses our minds on what we can collectively do to remove all of those barriers. It is not the role of disabled women to fit in. It is our collective role to ensure that places and spaces work for disabled women. With all movements, we're really grateful for our allies who have supported and built the platform alongside us. At Faikaha, we committed to a future where we recognise and commit to our collective responsibility to remove barriers and steward change across government around housing, health, education and employment, sport and recreation. There is no agency in town that does not deliver supports and services for disabled people. I just want to touch on a couple of those areas. Firstly, employment. We know that for decades, disabled women haven't had their strengths recognised, nor the same leadership and employment opportunities. It's really interesting recruiting to Faikaha and realising that we have got to grow this talent pool of amazing disabled people. I want to see more disabled women employed in leadership positions and participating on truly diverse companies and boards. Stats show the unemployment rate for disabled people is over twice that of non-disabled people. Disabled people earn less on average than non-disabled people. Nearly half, 48% of disabled women in the workforce earn less than 30,000 per year and disabled women have a pay gap of 19%. Yes, nearly 20% when compared to all men, and a gap of 3.8% when compared to disabled men. A simple summary of those numbers is disabled women are significantly less employed than disabled men, and those who are employed are paid noticeably less. We have to collectively, if we really want to achieve equity for women, then actually we need to achieve equity for disabled women as part of that. So I encourage all employers to recognise the benefits, skills and talents that my community brings. I want to touch on a second important theme that's been raised today around family and sexual violence. Addressing family and sexual violence has been a priority for the government with the launch under the leadership of Minister Davison, uh, the launch of Te Arerikura, the national strategy to eliminate family and sexual violence. And I want to just acknowledge the work that Zont has done in that area as well. For decades, disabled people in Tangata Whaikaha Māori have been quite invisible in the nation's growing awareness of the significant problem of family and sexual violence. Violence is one of the gravest symptoms of ableism. That other ism word we don't really talk about, ableism. A key step to recognise the magnitude of violence is understanding the numbers. Conservatively, the magnitude is estimated as twice the overall rate as for non-disabled people, increasing to between four and five times the rate for disabled children and women. Disabled women living a life free from exploitation, neglect or abuse is just a fundamental right. In recent years, there's been an increasing focus on experiences of abuse for disabled people. A particular focus has been where people rely on a high level of support, such as those living in residential services or other socially complex situations. And we've seen through the work of the Royal Commission of Inquiry into Abuse in State Care that a truly systemic approach has to be taken to prevent harm. 
I'm really pleased that my agency has the role of leading the government's response to Action 28 of the Te, Are, Te Arerikura Plan, which is around safeguarding the responses for disabled and vulnerable adults. So we're working alongside others to put that into action. So, in closing, as we embark on our day with embrace equity etched into our thinking, please, in every aspect of your work, think about whether when you talk about all women, you're doing everything you can to make sure that it is all women. Let's bring everyone together and their whole lives and whole selves together. Let's carry on this momentum for meaningful change and really smash the ceiling so that everyone can get through. Many years have passed since my five-year-old self was zipping around the streets of the Kapiti Coast on a bike, wanting to fit in. And my entire life focus is on improving outcomes for disabled people, like that five-year-old, so that she doesn't have to try and fit into her community and her country, but the whole country makes sure that she fits in, particularly that other women make sure that she fits in. Namahi nui ki koutou katoa. Ms. Paula, on behalf of Zonta Club of Wellington, thank you very much for an inspiring and enlightening speech. Thank you for impacting our International Women's Day celebration with such an awakening and valuable information about Twaikaha. Thank you for all that you do. You are such an inspiration. We have a Zonta Yellow Roses here for you. Please accept it with our sincere thanks. Thank you to all of our magnificent speakers and thank you all for your participation this morning. I hope you feel uplifted and inspired by the range of insights shared by our speakers this morning. Importantly, I hope you feel refreshed with renewed energy to do what you can to embrace equity in your lives, to support women and girls in all of their diversity, to be yourself, to be rebellious, and to demand the change needed at the systems level to remove structural and systemic barriers and ensure an equitable playing field for all. I now have the pleasure of closing our event in the Pacific way in my heritage language of Samoan. I will now give thanks that our gathering has concluded well and to ask for blessings on each and every one of us throughout our movements today. Tato te talo, lo ma tau te mai o ele langi, fa fatai o i u male manuia, la ma tau ma kutanga nei, fa manuia mai a te i ma tau te i tuatasi, ia tu mau pea le anganga pa ia, i longa o ma tau la sanga uma, i lo sua fa pa ia, amen. Well, that concludes the formalities. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Official photos will be taken in the banquet hall, and if you are part of the group that has arranged for an official photo, please make your way to the banquet hall now. Otherwise, thank you so much for your company this morning. Keep safe and well, and have a good day.